The next step is to plan this experimental design. This is about how to apply the treatments, on what groups, in what order, using what material, etc. All of these questions need to be answered as a consequence of experimental design. When creating an experimental design, we need to take into account certain issues that may arise. And some examples of that are, for, uh, are learning effects, ordering effects, and so on. What does that mean? A learning effect is if you have a subject performing multiple tasks, performing first task A and then task B, that may lead to a situation where the subject first learns from the execution of task A and therefore the performance on task B is different from what it would be if task B would have been done directly. This we call a learning effect which changed the performance on task B. If task A was the first task then there is no learning effect. Ordering effects may mean um, that depending on the order of the individual task uh, that may lead to different outcomes. For example, if it first do task A and then task B, the transfer may be different from first doing task B and then doing task A. In practice, we usually cannot control for all of these possible uh, influential factors, but we try at least to address some of them. Uh, so if we do a multitask uh, experiment, then typically we take learning effects into account and have designs where the task order is also happening in a flipped manner. Certain design principles that need to be taken into account during experimental design. A very common principle is so-called randomization. That means we have Statistical methods require that observations are from independent random variables and we try to enforce that by randomizing the allocation of the objects or of the subjects and the order of the tests. You may have heard about that from medical uh, testing or drug testing um, where people are randomly allocated whether they get a treatment or not. This is exactly to create this, um, these independent random variables. That's a standard procedure. However, one should take into account, just like with randomization uh, from, the, uh, from the subject selection, that randomization by itself is not a guarantee that the people assigned to the different treatments will have the same distribution. We can try to enforce that by doing so-called blocking. Let's say we are interested in different uh, groups of experience and we want to have that uh, for the different treatments the experience is or the distribution of the experience is roughly the same for each of the treatments. What we then do is so-called blocking. We create a blocks uh, of subjects that are formed by having the same value for some undesirable independent variable. In that case, this variable could be experience. It's undesirable in that sense that it may uh, complicate our overall um, uh, study in some way. And then we can try to assign uh, people randomly from this block or from each block to the different treatments. As a result, the distribution of this variable will be the same for all of the treatments. The problem with that is doing multiple blocking. If let's say we have five different variables uh, in which we are interested. And now we want to create the same distribution for all of these five different variables for the people. Then we actually have the problem that this would lead to, uh, to very, very small uh, 
numbers of people on, on which from which we can draw, or to put it vice versa, we would need a very large number of subjects to create a similar distribution in all of these dimensions. Then there is balancing. That is, groups or blocks may, uh, should have the same number of members. That is typically uh, done uh, rather easily by just assigning people uh, in a uh, in a even uh, way. It, however, requires that we, to some extent, force people towards a specific assignment of treatments, meaning not necessary self-selection. Time for another exercise. So let's assume we give everyone a number as people arrive to class. Just envision uh, a normal physical class. Everybody comes through the door and as soon as they come through, we put them a sequential number in the hand. And then we put the first half of the people in one group and the second half of the people in the other. What kind of design principle do we use here? Have a look at the four options are listed. Stop the videos, make your decisions, and then come back. Of course, in principle, also multiple can apply. Welcome back. Let's now discuss each of those in sequence. Randomization. Did we randomize people? Of course, someone could ask uh, or could argue that people come more or less uh, in a random order. However, that's not really true. There might be underlying factors like they might have together another class which is located close by and they just come over as soon as that finished, so they are particularly early. Um, or some others are, have uh, a class on the other end of the campus and they come particularly late for that. Or some people are particularly interested in the topic, so they make an effort to be rather early and so not to miss the beginning of it. All of these could be independent variables and we would not randomize in that way for it. Do we do blocking? Well, given on the discussion I just gave, probably would we would actually pe uh, put people with the same values for independent variables in the same uh, treatment group. So that's basically the opposite idea of blocking, uh, meaning assigning people uh, from the same block to different treatment groups. Uh, so that's also definitely not the case. Do we balance? Well, on the highest level, yes. We would have the same number of people in both groups. So balancing would be okay. Uh, but it would be really on this extremely high level with a high risk of lumping together uh, very different people, uh, uh, sorry, people with with similar factors in, in one of the treatment groups and then uh, leading to a disparity of the factors among the two different treatment groups. How can we do better than that? Well, randomization uh, we can achieve by simply giving everybody as soon as they enter a random number. And in that way we could um, then simply do the randomization by saying we know there will be like 30 people coming and then we give everybody a random number from 1 to 30 and then we say everybody from 1 to 15 goes in one group and everybody from 16 to 30 goes in the other group and in that way we would have a, a clear assignment where people are randomly allocated to the different groups. There are some standard experimental designs. Actually, quite a number of those have been discussed in literature. However, we will discuss here only the two most common 
design types. The first is a so-called one-factor, two or more treatment design. What does it mean? One factor means there's one independent variable that we want to vary by giving different treatments for it. So we have two or more expressions of this factor. Going back to some earlier example where we said, for example, you want to introduce a method for a better uh, or for achieving higher productivity in some context, uh, and here the factor would be the application of this method, the two different treatments, there would only be two, would be I use the method or I do not use the method. And then what the table shows is for each of the subjects that are part of the experiment, we would uh, we give whether they uh, receive treatment one, which would be use the method, treatment two, do not use the method. A more complex example is when I have two factors, two different independent variables that I want to vary as part of the experiment. And for each of these factors I have treatments. So for factor A I have treatment A1 and A2, and for factor B I have treatment B1 and B2. And the result of that is, of course, I have four different combinations. So I have subjects for each of these four different cells. That, that's what would this lead to. And then there are, there are more cases uh, depending on if I have more treatments than just the two or more factors and then there's also if I have multiple tasks which I then uh, have to combine in different ways and so on. For a running example this means we have a, uh, our design would be a one factor two treatment uh, experiment where we have the computer science versus the electrical engineering and for the productivity case because we want to study the impact of this computer science versus electrical engineering on the productivity and we have one factor more treatments meaning experience grading uh, um, and its influence on the on programming in C. Uh, so, however, it should also be observed in the running example that we actually perform both experiments in this at the same time with the same executions. Meaning, in that case, it's a bit specific that they are actually overlaid on each other. So we have a CS and EE course. In each of those, we have all the people graded with respect to their experience. Then they do C programming. And from the C programming, we get both productivity and fault data. So it's the same execution of experiments that actually informs both designs at the same time. However, technically, these are two independent designs. So it's a smart overlay to minimize the total effort or to put it other way around to get the most information from the work that the subjects are doing. Exercise. Can we replace a two-factor, two-treatment experiment by a two, by two, sorry, by two one-factor, two-treatment experiments? Yes or no? Take your time, stop the video, and come back. Okay, well, come back. So, here's the answer. It's no. Yeah? As you saw on the previous slide, let's go back. If I have a two-factor, two-treatment experiment, I actually need to analyze all four different combinations. Um, if I have two independent uh, experiments with where I 
um, uh, evaluate the different treatments, then actually I do not get necessarily uh, the different combinations of the treatments. So that's not equivalent. The next step is so-called instrumentation. Typically we differentiate three different types of instruments or three different categories. The first one are objects. These are basic experimental artifacts that we need in order to execute the experiment. The specific character of these artifacts depend on the kind of experiment we are going to do. For example, for software engineering, this could be source code or tools or specifications. If we are interested in business processes, it might be orders or bills, things like that. These artifacts need to be specifically created and designed to support the experiment we are going to run. Let me give you an example. Let's say we are interested in a reading technique in order to identify defects in source code. What that means is we need to provide all the different subjects with some source code on which they can apply the method and then we are going to, to collect data about how effectively they identify defects in there. This has many ramifications for the artifacts in order to be usable in the experiment. First of all, it may not be too big because then the subjects will not be able to apply the methods on these artifacts within the given time. Second, it may not be too small or trivial because then the results will not be comparable or transferable to the case of a real-world source code, you know, impacting negatively the external validity of the experiment we are running. Also, we may want to compare different categories of defects. However, in order for that to happen, we need to have these categories of defects already in the code. Yeah? So we need to make sure the code that we are going to give the subjects contain exactly those defects we are interested in, or these categories of defects we are interested in, and we exactly know which defects are where to be found, and also there are no defects beyond those we are, would like there to be in the source code. Yeah? And that's actually a pretty significant task to create these experimental artifacts adequately. It's really not easy. They should be representative of what we, should, what we want to know uh, as part of this experiment. The next category of instruments are the guidelines. There are different guidelines typically. There are so-called experimental guidelines that give a step-by-step -step process on how the experiment should proceed and what the experimenters should do during running the experiment. For example, it's first we need to give the participant this and that information, uh, perhaps writing down precisely the the uh, what is said word by word, then we distribute the forms, etc., etc. Uh, so it's really a step by step procedure for running the experiment, also to make it repeatable by others later on. Then we often give guidelines to the subjects um, that so should assist them in executing whatever tasks they should execute during the experiment and also typically an introduction on the subject matter is given to the subjects as well. This introduction uh, is necessary because typically people will not know, for example, the method yet that should be evaluated during the experiment. Yeah, so this introduction material is typically given before the main part of the experiment starts. Sometimes it's more like a lecture, sometimes it uh, also includes uh, pre, uh, initial exercises to make sure the subjects really understood the guidelines fully and so on. Then there are so-called measurement instruments. These provide the basis for data collection. Often these takes, uh, or these are forms, 
These could be paper forms or online forms. Um, if the experiments are conducted in an uh, online fashion, it can also be to some extent automatic. Uh, for example, by instrumenting the tool or by collecting the data automatically. For example, if we are interested in the execution of a business process we, that is executed with the help of some tool, we may measure from the tool uh, what steps are done as, uh, with the tool, how much time passes between two button clicks and which button is clicked in which order and so on. All of that could be automatically collected and would then count as a measurement instrument as part of the instrumentation of this experiment. In the running example, there we have as objects 10 programs that I used on a regular basis for this PSP course. So it's actually the programs that were used for teaching PSP anyway. Uh, and they are just reused here. Then we have guidelines and measurements. These are provided to PSP already because this is a, a process that already provides a lot of personal guidelines and measurement templates so they can just be taken from this. And then there's background and experience. This is collected through survey forms as additional measurement instrument and that was taken during the first lecture of the students. The next step is then so-called validity evaluation. This is the idea that we want to predict the validity of the outcome before we even run the experiments. So we want to answer the question, once we run the experiment, will the results be valid? Of course, a full evaluation can only be done after the experiment execution, but the more problems we identify up front and actually resolve up front by changing our plans to take care of this, the better. Yeah? So basically we, uh, we repeatedly try run the experiment in our heads in order to predict any validity problems early on. In our running example we have conclusion validity um, <clears throat> which is about the statistical testing that will be needed to be done. Here a certain concern is the quality of the data collected may be faked or incorrect. The reason is that people did the actual execution as homework and as a result they can of course write down anything. Uh, so that is definitely an issue for the data collection and therefore for conclusion validity. However, as inconsistencies will not be systematic, Probably such faked or incorrect data stands out as an outlier in our tests and we can actually identify it in that way and remove the data later on. Intern validity. Here we have the benefit that there is a large number of tests because of all 65 students were participating, so that's not such a big issue. The construct validities, the measurements may not be appropriate, the students may be biased, etc., meaning we may not necessarily measure what we think we measure, uh, and th these context factors may impact what we actually measure. Uh, to some extent, uh, this is less of a concern because that more or less would apply to all of the participants in the same way. Uh, unless, of course, the measurements itself, like uh, the kind of uh, programs that we are using, if those are not appropriate to characterize the task, then, of course, it would be a generic issue. External validity is about can the results of this study be transferred to other contexts? Here, what we can say is uh, PSB students of computer science and electronic engineering at the same university will probably yield similar results. Not the identical ones, certainly, because there are from person to person differences, uh, but within this range they should be similar. 
if we talk about other students with different interests without having a PSP course with a different university where people have a somewhat different background or even to professional environments, then the transferability becomes uh, reduced due to that, definitely. So we cannot automatically uh, think or expect that to all of these other contexts it can be fully transferred. However, it should still give us an idea. The next step is the data collection. We should always perform a pre-study as part of this preparation step, because no matter how detailed our planning was, there will often be some uh, residual problems that we should try to identify through such as pre-study. Pre-study means we take one or two subjects and they do the experiment only to identify issues with the experiment material, not for the data gathering itself. Problems that can be identified that way could be like the sequence of steps doesn't really work for the people, the guidelines are unclear in places leading to asking back, which is problematic if you do it in a real experiment, there can be operational issues, like the time is not sufficient, there's not all the information available that the subjects need, tools may be problems with the operation of them, and also is the data really sufficient to establish a conclusion um, can, can also be an issue that comes up and can be identified within limits by such a pre-study. So typically, if you do such a pre-study, you are bound for surprises. And you want to have these surprises in the pre-study, not in the actual experiment. That's very important. Also, typically, because you're doing experiments with human subjects, some sort of approval will be needed, for example, through an ethics committee. And of course, we need to identify and get consent from experiment subjects. That means we need to clarify what will happen to them. And typically, they have then to sign such a content form. It needs to be taken care that we are not talking or telling them what will be the expected outcome, because this may strongly influence experimental results. This has been shown again and again as soon as you tell people what they expect, like method A is better than method B, they adapt their behavior to make that true, basically. But on the other hand, in order to really inform people, they should get this information as soon as possible afterwards. They should not be left in the dark what was done with the experiment that they executed. Next, we can execute the experiment. We typically start this with setting up the environment because environmental factors may influence the experiment execution and its outcome strongly, leading to incorrect results. For example, if people need to sit uncomfortably at a desk where they can hardly write and writing is part of the experiment, then this will definitely impact how fast they can work and how correctly they can work. Also, if we involve any computer tools, then we need to be sure that they are really running for all participants, that everyone can access that on the corresponding computer. We need, may need to control the environment also in the sense of what tools uh, and what computers people use. We need to be sure that our forms are correct and complete, and so on and so on. Setting up the environment for an experiment is actually rather similar to setting up the environment for an exam. It's basically the same thing. You want to have an environment where everybody can work well and in a repeatable and comparable fashion for everyone involved. Then we need to assign the people to groups. Uh, if we used a blocked assignment, then we also need to gather data beforehand or as as a first step within this assignment and to, uh, to determine the blocking categories and then distribute people accordingly. Then we can 
finally conduct the experiment according to our plan, based on the experimental guidelines, and then we do some initial data validation that's still considered part of the main experiment execution before we go to the analysis, because this data validation is about is this data meaningful and correct and was it appropriately a part of the experiment. Let's compare that with our running example. First we have the preparation. So in that case subjects were not aware of aspects of the study, hypothesis, etc. They only knew that an experiment was done and that the outcome of PSP is interesting to this experiment. Anonymity was as a result also guaranteed. Um, that's actually a best practice. Use, uh, use the aggregated data and make it anonymous in the sense that you uh, do not link it to the individual person. Then execution. This was actually done over 14 weeks in, as part of a lecture and as part of that 10 programming tasks were assigned. All the data were collected through forms. Interviews at the end were used to evaluate the course and PSB and the overall results, of course. As part of data validation, they found that data of six students were removed as invalid or at least questionable. Forms were not filled out properly. Some finished the course or assignments later, uh, one due to different background, and so on. So that they concluded the data from these six students, if we integrate it in our analysis, it would actually be uh, some, some random diversion and not true data from the experiment. This is, of course, a problem that is stronger if one does it in parallel over a longer time with homework than if we have everybody together in a room for one and a half hour.